Yeah. Happy yes. New Year. Year. Uh, we're in the year 2023. Mm. Yes. Didn't know if we would make this date, you know, but God has been faithful yes. all of these years. Yes. Um, I've had the opportunity to teach uh, through this through this course uh, quite a few times. It's to me, it's the the very heart, the very center of our Bible school. Um, it was written by a brother named Gordon Olson, and our teaching is taken from this uh, book here entitled The Truth Shall Set You Free, and this book represents a monumental labor by a brother named Gordon Olson. Uh, brother Olson had just a little biography. Uh, brother Olson had gone to Bible school and become a pastor and pastored, I believe it was in Indiana somewhere, a small rural church. And he really had a burden in his heart for revival. You know, for, and so he began preaching uh, a, a series of messages that, that he felt would promote revival. And uh, before he knew it, um, the, some of the leading elders in his church piano player, you know, the, the main core of his church, uh, came to him privately and said, you know, Brother Olson, uh, we, we took seriously what you said. You know, we were convicted of our sin by the Holy Spirit. We went out in the cornfield and got down on our knees before God and gave our hearts to God, and, and I've just been saved. Wow. And he said, what? You know, <laughs> you know, you're the elder of our church. What do you mean you've just been saved? And it, it caused a real conflict in his mind because he assumed that they were good Christians, that they had been saved, and it was contrary to the uh, theology that he had learned in the Bible school that he had gone to. Oh. And so uh, that particular summer, he, he just dedicated himself to, to reading the New Testament over and over and over again during his spare time, you know, and God began to reveal uh, truth to him. Uh, he eventually resigned the pastorate, went back into his field of engineering, and became a leading engineer with um, International Harvester. Uh, company developing tractors. He is a world-renowned engineer, very, very intelligent. But while he was doing his engineering 40 hours a week to provide for his family, he made it a practice to do biblical research 30 hours a week mm. for 30 years. Wow. And so what, what you have in your hand here is a result of a tremendous, tremendous amount of biblical research. And the way he approached it was with the mind of an engineer, uh, not with preconceived ideas, because he already had, you know, theology from the Bible school, but he said, you know, I'm putting that aside. I want to know for myself what the Bible is really teaching. So, for example, on, on a subject, let's say, of sin, he would go through the Bible, write out every single verse in the Bible that had anything to do with sin, and then categorize them, and, and, and then say, now, now what does this mean to me? You know, and going through the whole process on his knees in prayer, is is the man of prayer and faith, and... Again, what you have here is a result of that 30 years of biblical research. Toward the end of that time, he would, he would take his vacation from his engineering job and take his trailer and go to places like Oberlin University, uh, where Charles Finney was the president years ago, and, and places out east, and eventually even in Europe to study, you know, what, what was preached in times past that God honored with great revival. You know, what was the message that the Holy Spirit would stand behind and bring revival? 
And he was very gratified to find out that what they preached in many of the revivals were the same conclusions that he had come up with, you know, in his own independent research. And so that was, that was very, you know, he was happy about that. And later in life, he taught with Youth with a Mission uh, in different places, and, and he impacted my life greatly. We, we came across this material, I think, in uh, the fall of 76, 1976, uh, when I was confronted, uh, and this is another story, uh, the group, the, the, the Christian outreach group that Doris and I were involved with in our university days, I uh, was led by a, an evangelist, a brother, spirit-filled man, and one of his supporters, he had been a missionary to Germany to the servicemen, one of his supporters was a man named Harry Kahn, who was also an engineer in his own right, very prominent engineer, and a good friend and disciple of Gordon Olson. And so they had been out in uh, Philadelphia in the year 1776, our bicentennial year, to do street witnessing all summer long uh, for people who came to Independence Hall and Liberty Bell uh, because it was 200th anniversary of America. And at the end of this summer, our, our friend Kathy Lytle uh, really became disillusioned with where she was at in her spiritual life in that she was confronted by, they're witnessing every day on the streets, she was confronted by people that asked her, her questions that she did not have the answers to. And that really bothered her because she's a very brilliant lady herself. And uh, she had said in her mind, you know, if I, if I can't get answers, to my questions, I'm, you know, I'm just going to walk away from it. Or maybe not that severe, but that, you know, the, her attitude was... Um, she couldn't go out and witness until yeah, she had answers. Yeah, she, she could not really witness unless she had good, solid answers. And so on the way back uh, from Philadelphia, uh, the team leader, Ray Cap, and the team stopped at... Uh, the corporation that Harry Kahn was in charge of, employees, 1,600 employees, you know, it's a big business in the Rockford, Illinois area, machine tools. Uh, he made machine tools. And um, when they went in there, um, Harry, Harry told the secretary, you know, I don't want any calls today. Took him into the boardroom and taught him from eight hours, eight hours in the morning, you know, eight to five, he taught them, you know, the principles of moral government. And when they left, you know, it just totally had answered the questions of, of my friend. So when we went out to visit them over Thanksgiving, uh, we're in a restaurant and uh, my friend was sharing what she had learned. And I, at that time, you know, had done a lot of reading and uh, most of what I read was from a Calvinistic uh, viewpoint. And so uh, I tried to defend what I, up to that time, had believed was the truth. Mm -hmm. And my, my friend absolutely annihilated me, <laughs> if I could use that word, uh, with, with her arguments in a good way. Wow. You know, because uh, I, I had just graduated from graduate school, and I had enough good sense to, to know how to think logically um, f because of that training. And, um, you know, the argument she presented, I had to come to the conclusion that you're right, I'm wrong. You know, where'd you get this information? <laughs> wow. You know, because I saw that she was absolutely right. And the question that, that got me was the one on uh, born sinful original sin. I was trying to defend it uh, because that's what I've been taught and read many books about it and had all the proof texts down to share 
but I felt like somebody, um, the picture I had in my mind was somebody with a dartboard, you know, and I'm <laughs> sitting there, <laughs> and every argument I bring up, you know, the, the dart comes, just, just pops my, every argument that I could bring up. And at the end, I said, well, you know, I have to admit that you're, you're right, but where, where did you get this information? And so she said, well, it's Gordon Olson. And um, so we contacted him, and I got the tapes that, of Gordon Olson teaching his own material with the Youth with a Mission schools in Switzerland. And I think that was 76 that he did that, 75, 76, mm -hmm. sometime in there. So I got those tapes. There's about 40 in the cassette tape series. Mm -hmm. And so I just began listening to them over and over and over again, mm -hmm. especially when we built the house and, you know, you're, you just had the, the tape going and, and listening to And those. they can listen to it on YouTube, just Google Gordon Olson. Oh, yes, it is on YouTube, some of his teaching. For those of you out uh, away from this venue, uh, you can find it if you Google or if you put Gordon Olson. Uh, there'll be some of his lectures there. And, and so I just wanted to share that as a little bit of a background <coughs> because it's been very influential in, in my own life. I would like to go through the, uh, the table of contents of what we will study in the next three to four weeks. I'm not sure exactly the pace it will have, but, but it will certainly be done in four weeks. I normally teach this in three weeks in our overseas school, going three hours, you know, five days a week for, th for three weeks. So about 45 hours, but many times I'm using an interpreter, you know, so that slows us down. So again, uh, we'll adjust our pace as we go along uh, because there's many scriptures. <coughs> and so going through the table of contents, what we'll cover in the next uh, three to four weeks. Tonight, our first lesson is um, our natural observations. And again, what we have here is basically a systematic theology of, you know, God, who is God, who is man, what is salvation, you know, what is the victorious Christian life. And so our first is our natural observations, you know, what we can learn about God even before we open the Bible, because you realize that most people who have ever lived and died in this world have never seen the Bible. Your ancestors, four or five generations back, maybe a little bit longer because of, you know, our English heritage, but, you know, certainly 10 generations, 15 generations back, you know, they did not have a Bible. They never saw a Bible. Uh, the people in the Old Testament you know, the Jews had the scripture, uh, but most of the world were not Jewish. Uh, there are billions of people that have lived and died that have never seen the Bible. But yet the Bible declares that there's a day of judgment when every moral being who's ever been created will stand before Almighty God and give an account of their life. And you would think that the greatest excuse or the greatest justification they would have is, well, God, we didn't have a Bible. How can you throw me into hell when I've never even seen the Bible? Yet Romans 1 tells us that everyone will stand before God at the day of judgment, and give an account, and it says there will be no excuse. And again, I would think this would be a pretty good excuse. I never saw a Bible, but yet God said there's no excuse. So, if that is true, where does the knowledge come from that God holds us responsible to obey? 
and it comes, you know, as we'll see tonight through our through just living in this world and using our brain that God gave us, that we know there's a God, and we know how we ought to treat one another. Uh, the second lesson is about the Bible, and it lays it builds our confidence that the Bible truly is the inspired Word of God. Again, we have to have that as a bedrock um, conclusion in our hearts and minds if we're going to go on. You know, we simply must believe that the Bible truly is the inspired Word of God. And so it goes through how, how it was written. Then chapter 3 or lesson three is the nature and character of God. And we'll spend probably the most time on that lesson uh, than any other lesson. We'll look at God's natural attributes and his moral attributes. God has natural attributes. That is simply a dis description of who he is. An attribute is something that describes something. You know, like an attribute of this chair is that it has four legs. This particular one's made of metal. You know, those are attributes describing that chair. So God has natural attributes. He's a spirit. He's all powerful. He's all, he, he knows all that can be known. Uh, he's omnipresent. Uh, so these are some of the natural attributes of God. Then he has moral attributes. And of course, the word the word moral has to do with right and right or wrong. It has to do with choice. And so God's moral attributes is how God chooses to use His mighty natural attributes. See, God has a choice. God is love. That's the greatest of his moral attributes. But love is a choice. See, and, and, and this is what makes God so lovely and so wonderful. He, he's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. You know, he, he's so mighty, but he has a free will. And he could have used his power in malevolent ways, but he's too intelligent to do that. You know, he, he knows that love is the greatest, the greatest thing, but he has a choice. Mm -hmm. And so his moral attributes are what God is by his own choice. Goodness, uh, justice is a moral attribute of God, uh, loving kindness, mercy, patience. Uh, these are, these are uh, choices uh, that a moral being makes. Um, so truth and faithfulness, uh, love, you know, these are his moral attributes. <clears throat> Lesson four deals with man's creation and relationships. And so we're looking at the nature of man. Lesson three, we look at the nature of God, now the nature of man. And we understand that we're made in the image of God and what that means, uh, the relationships that he's placed us in, and we'll see that he's placed us in a moral government, that we are to be governed by truth, addressed to our minds, because we're moral agents just as our Creator is. Then lesson five is man's rebellion against God. And of course this is, deals with the sin issue. And we'll find out what, what sin really is. And the simple answer is simply rebellion against God. It's a choice. It's not something we're born with. It's something that we choose to do. So if we were born a sinner, that would be our nature. 
and sin would be natural. But we're born as a moral agent, and we'll find that sin is not natural. It's not normal. It becomes our normal, and man does develop a sinful nature, but he does it by his own choices, one choice after another. But God created man to, to walk the way he walks, to live like he lives, uh, to, to walk with a pure heart, a loving motive. But we see the man rebelled against God. And I pray that as we go through that lesson, we'll come to a point where we really hate sin, especially in our own heart not tolerate it, not have anything to do with it, not promote it, but hate it. As was said to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore the Lord anointed him with the oil of joy above his fellows. See, that was the that was the, um, the reason for the great anointing that he had. It says, love for righteousness is holy hatred for sin. Uh, six is the consequences of man's rebellion. You know, what happened when man sinned? And what we'll learn here is that the most tragic consequence of man's rebellion is not what it did to us, but what it did to God. You know, and we are so ingrained in selfishness that, that we only think, well, what do I have to pay for my sin? But we very seldom consider what sin did to God and how it just absolutely broke his heart. You know, which is proof that it's preventable. But it broke his heart. Then we look at man's reconciliation to God. And under this heading, we are looking at the problems that a holy God faces in redeeming a sinful man. You know, how he's going to reconcile us and bring us back to him. And God had problems he had to solve at the cross. Uh, they're governmental problems. He's the king of his kingdom. He gave a law. The law was love. Man violated his law with impunity. To enforce God's law, he gave the highest consequence, the highest penalty that he could come up with. The soul that sinneth it shall surely die. So that now you've got a problem facing God. He's given his law, which is for our good always, He's given a consequence, a tremendous consequence, simply to encourage obedience and discourage disobedience. The man rebelled. And if you take away the consequence through forgiveness, I forgive you, it, encourage, it encourages rebellion in all of his kingdom. See, when you don't enforce the law, you have what we have in the United States, just anarchy. God doesn't do that in his kingdom. He's given us his law for our good. He sanctioned it with a consequence. And now he has to deal with that. How, how does a holy God uphold his law and at the same time show mercy to repentant sinners? They took the atonement of Christ to accomplish that. And so that chapter deals with, you know, what has to take place for man to be reconciled to God. Then the next lesson is the life and atoning death of Christ. That's how Jesus solved the problems between a holy God and sinful man. And so that, that takes us up to the cross. Then point nine, now it's the cross applied to our hearts. 
you know, God did his part. Now what has to take place in our hearts and life? And we say that there's a process of spiritual awakening that has to take place. That because men love darkness rather than light, because his deeds are evil, yet to be saved, he's got to come to the light. He's got to walk in the light. But he hates light. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. So he's running away from God. What does it take to shake up a sinner to the place where they begin to examine God's claims in their life? Mm -hmm. And usually it's, you know, some hard times, some calamities, some, you know, rough things that we go through. You know, very few people are come to, to true repentance when everything is just rosy and going great. It's usually in a crisis. But this process of spiritual awakening. Then point, uh, lesson 10 is repentance towards God. And we'll see that that is an absolute requirement, both the Old and New Testament, uh, that man re must repent. And that is a turning away <coughs> from sin. Not just saying I'm sorry for it, but a turning away from it. And then faith in our Lord Jesus Christ as a condition. Uh, then 12, uh, you'll find this one very exciting, I believe. Uh, transformation of heart and life. You know, the promises of the New Testament of what God promises to do for a believer. Of totally transforming them. And, and, you know, the, the promises that are there. Uh, 13, we see that there's a, a further condition for final salvation, and that is that we must continue in that love relationship with God. That, um, you know, it's a relationship, and relationships can be broken, and so relationships must be maintained. Uh, 14 is very similar to 12. It's establishment in the life of sanctification. Um, is there a place in the Christian walk where it becomes easier, uh, you know, to walk in holiness than it is to go the other way? And the answer is a resounding yes. You know, that's the provision, that's his will, that's what he wants for each one of us to learn how to walk before him in holiness. And, and so those lessons, again, deal with us individually. Now our final lesson is, now that this salvation process has occurred in our hearts and lives, how do we work with God to win the world for him? So it's our participation in God's activities. So that's our outline for the next three, three to four weeks. And let's, uh, you know, approach this with a real attitude of prayer and an attitude of, Lord, you know, I want your truth. Lord, teach me. I'm hungry for you. And, you know, the, the Lord will meet with us. I'm praying that, you know, during this month that we share together, God will really meet with us and, and give us, you know, divine revelation that's far beyond my limited ability to, you know, convey, convey truth. Praise the Lord. So tonight we're going to start with lesson one, our natural observations. And let's turn to Romans 1, and I think we'll start with verse 18. Romans 1, 18? Sure. <clears throat> I've got it here. Okay. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold back 
push back the truth in unrighteousness for an unrighteous motive. God's mad. He's angry. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all sin, all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who are suppressing or pushing back the truth and unrighteousness because they don't want it. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So verse 19 says, His invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature are clearly seen. How do you clearly see an invisible attribute? You can do the heavens and the stars and the ocean and the trees and the seasons and exactly the magnificence of exactly. It says his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature are clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So there's no excuse. The Bible tells us. And so let's let's begin a little journey here and and use our imagination and use our natural observation. We're, you know, toward the end of our life's journey, we've lived a while, we've experienced many things in this world. Uh, let's begin our journey by, by just simply looking inward to ourselves. And here we have Psalm 8, verse 4. <clears throat> because when we look inward, we're not being unique. Uh, we're just simply being human. Because all of us, at one point or another, have done that. Here we have the testimony of David, <coughs> the young shepherd boy. Well, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visits him? Yeah, so he said, when I consider the heavens, the, the work of thy fingers, the moon and stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him. And that question, what is man? Who am I? You know, we've all asked the who, who am I question. You know, and usually we ask that quite, quite yeah, as youngsters, you know, four, five, six, who, who am I? And when we think about it, who am I? Uh, we can come to certain conclusions. We recognize that we have a, an ability to think. <clears throat> we have an ability to, uh, to picture things in our mind that are not before us at, at the present time that we can think in terms of pictures as well as, as words. In fact, the words, you know, develop a picture or a concept in our mind. And, and we call this our imagination. <clears throat> you know, and, and we have this facility uh, to not only to think and to ponder and to reason, mm -hmm. wasn't it a French philosopher who said, "I think, therefore that, I am." Therefore I am. Mm -hmm. Who was that? Mm -hmm. I think it's it was Pascal, Descartes. wasn't it? Descartes, mm -hmm. or maybe Descartes. Voltaire. Who knows? One of them. <laughs> But again, asking the same question that David did, when I consider the heaven, who am I? You know, what, 
what kind of an individual I am. And uh, the philosopher said, I think, therefore I am. So we're, we have a self-consciousness. We're, cut, we're aware of the fact that we're unique. We're self-conscious that I am me. There's no other me out there. <laughs> it was this card. Descartes. Yes. So, so we ha have this, you know, uniqueness that, that I am unique, yet I have something in common with, with all other people. I, I can think, I can reason, I have an imagination. Uh, we're conscious of something within that evaluates our actions. Something that compares what we know with what we do. And of course we call this our conscience. Conscience. That's what tells us what is right and wrong. Because in our mind, uh, we soon develop ideas of what is right and wrong. And we develop these ideas through our social interaction. You know, when we're a little five-year-old boy, we don't want that other five-year-old boy stealing our marbles. And when he does, we feel highly offended. You know, that was wrong. And, and so when that consciousness comes to us, you know, that's wrong for you to steal my marbles, then it becomes wrong for me to steal my sister's ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so at a very young age, through our social interactions, uh, using our minds, uh, experiencing life with each other, um, we develop a sense of, of what is right and wrong. And not only that, God himself puts his law within our heart. But we're aware that we have a facility of self-evaluation. And that compares what we know in our mind uh, to what we do, you know, with our will and our actions. And if we do what we know is right, uh, conscience approves. You, you know, you feel good. You know, when you go the extra mile, when you give a cup of water to a small child, you know, it makes you feel good. And that's simply your conscience evaluating uh, your actions. And it said, yeah, that's right. And of course, when you do what we know is wrong, we feel guilty because we are guilty. <laughs> yes. I remember some kids playing uh, in an apartment complex, and I, I just heard this kid's voice complaining to his mom about what had just happened to him by some other kid did this, this, this and he comes up with, and that's not fair. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm thinking already. Yeah, that's he's thinking about justice. That's deep, deep within there, you know. So they have this sense of fairness, okay. the sense of justice. Where'd that come from? Yeah, but again, you're absolutely right. At, at a very young age, uh, these these things are developed. So we have a mind to think and reason and ponder. We have imagination, we have self-consciousness, and of course the, the mind is, is open to truth, God's light. And before we have the Bible, God's light will come to us uh, through our relationships. God will, um, it says in Romans that, that he is put his law within our hearts, so we have a sense of justice. God has created man with this sense 
of right and wrong, of, of justice, yeah. but also through our interactions. I should put child and child, child with child, but with each other on the, this level, uh, we gain an understanding of what is right and wrong. And again, some of this comes from the fact that, that when people do bad things against us, it, it hurts us. You know, we do not enjoy people telling lies about it. You know, we sense the injustice of it. And, and as soon as that idea comes, you know, you lied to me, that was wrong. You know, then the idea develops in the mind, well, that's wrong for you to lie to other people. So we have these, these wonderful abilities, and of course we have memory. <clears throat> where all of the activities of life are stored. Uh, we may not recall everything, but they say it's there. Uh, like a video camera, your entire life is it's stored. And this is a wonderful <clears throat> gift from, from our Creator that God has given us a, a wonderful, you know, this ability to, to store memories. This is what makes learning possible. Because you don't have to learn your ABCs, and, you know, you learn them in kindergarten, then you can go on, you know, to higher things. And so memory makes, you know, learning, and there's no end to that. There's, there ought to be no end uh, to our moral development um, of how, how God can use us uh, because he's given us this mind and the memory uh, makes it possible to, to go on and on and on and on. If we would, but use it. <laughs> well, conversely, when I was speaking of the, of the kid, uh, that telling is telling his mom what the other kid did. He's explaining it, and then his conclusion was, "And that's not fair." It hit me, mm -hmm. just as a listener, that kids have a sense of fairness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever that, conversely on the other side, whatever that kid did to him, and I didn't hear the specifics. Perhaps didn't share a toy when he shared his. I'm sure our lessons here will include an explanation of the bad kid or the 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 offending kids uh behavior towards his mm -hmm. fellow peer there. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know that kid hit the nail on the head. That's wrong. <laughs> he he knew it was wrong and that that child had done wrong. Which implies he should have known better. You, you know, that's what that little kid is saying. You know, you knew better to do that. Mm -hmm. But you're not living up to what you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, and that, that becomes the issue. Um, if, if we did a dissection on a human cadaver which I've never done and I don't intend to do, but, <laughs> but if you become a doctor, you know, that's required, anatomy class. Uh, where would you, what, what organ, um, you know, is there an organ that you could pull out and say, this is the imagination? No. This is the memory? You know, so so we become conscious that there there's part of me that's not material, that's mm -hmm. spiritual, that I'm I must be a mm -hmm. spiritual being, that that I'm a spirit, that my personality <clears throat> is a spirit, and that is reinforced in our minds every time we have a birthday and our parents ask us, well, Johnny, it's actually our, our 
grandson Jackson's birthday today. He's 12 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but Johnny, you're 12. Do you feel any older? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> no. You know, and even now at our age, inside, you know, we feel like we always have. You know, if you think of your earliest childhood memories, uh, when you thought about things, uh, you heard your own voice in your mind when you're thinking. And from tonight to when you first were conscious to that, has that ever changed? You know, we feel the same inside. As, as we felt when we were way back in our youth. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. And years come and grow, and we get a little older and weaker and gray-haired, but on the inside, we feel exactly the same as we always have. And again, that reinforces the idea that I'm a spirit. I don't know why I put an H there, a spirit, uh, that resides in a physical body. And so we're asking the question that David asked, what, what is man? Who am I? We're conscious that we also have the ability to express emotion. We can feel joy, we can feel ecstasy, we can feel sorrow, we can feel grief. We, we experience a, a realm of emotions. An emotion... Uh, brings color to life. It, it, it um, helps us to define what is valuable, what is worthwhile. Um, because we, we enjoy a joyful feeling. We enjoy happiness. Uh, we enjoy uh, ecstasy. Um, in things we don't enjoy, you know, pain, sorrow, grief, uh, you know, we don't enjoy those things, uh, but yet we experience them. And so our, our emotion, if we really th come to think about it, are not under the direct control of your will. Your, your imagination is, your memory is, your actions are, but your emotions are reactions to what is taking place in your mind. And if you think about it, it's, it's true. You know, you can't command your emotions. You know, we could, we've done the demonstration before on the count of three, get angry. You know, you can't do that. But, you know, if you're provoked, you know, then the anger comes forth because you've just experienced an injustice, mm -hmm. you know, and you react to that. So our emotions are our reactions. And therefore, virtue, right or wrong, are not in the emotions. Virtue is not in the emotion. Just because you feel sad, just because you're sorrowing, does not mean you're in sin. You know, it's your mind is occupied with, with something that is bringing forth that, that sorrowful emotion. Then, then the crowning endowment of all is our free will. We're conscious of, of an ability to direct our lives, of, of, of being able to make choice choices of, of being able to choose. And so when we analyze personality, we, we see that we're really a unified whole personality. That everything we do begins with a choice of our will. It involves our minds. It may involve our imagination. Um, whatever the choice is, it's approved or disapproved by conscience, it's stored in the memory, and an emotion is experienced uh, from that particular choice.
So again, man, man is a unified whole personality, not a collection of parts that act independently, but a unified whole. Now, when it comes to the Bible, it often refers to the emotional reactions of mankind as, as soul. Sometimes soul means the whole personality, like there are eight souls saved on the ark. You know, so sometimes it means the whole person. But often, soul refers to the emotional uh, reactions of mankind. Like David says, as the heart pants for the water brook, so my soul yearns for thee. So he is an expression, expressing a, an emotional uh, yearning and longing after God. Free will in the Bible is often referred to as heart. The heart of man. Not the, not the physical pump. But it's, it's the, the, everything begins with the free will. And so when we say, I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart, what we're really saying, we're making a choice of our will, you know, to give our lives to God. It's a choice of our will. And so as we look at our inwardly, as we look at our, our, our spirit, and ask the question, who am I? I think we come up with these conclusions. That we're a thinking, imagining, self-conscious individual that has a conscience, that has a memory, that can learn, that experiences a wide range of emotions, and everything we do is directed by our choices. Uh, because we're a moral being made in the image of God. Uh, there's this, I put self-consciousness here, but we also have a God consciousness. Mm -hmm. God consciousness. Should have put it below and then I could have even digits. Yes, that we're conscious that there is a God. And that's what we read in Romans. That man, even apart from the Bible, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that he is without excuse. And so this is the personality of man, that we act as a unified whole, and it resides in a physical body. And because we are spirit, uh, when we die, our spirit goes back to its maker. And it's an eternal spirit. Mm -hmm. Because we're made in the image of God. And we, we recognize, we have eternity in our heart. It says in um, Ecclesiastes. You know, be, because again, we have that sense of timelessness. You know, we look in the mirror and we see the effects of time on this body, but on our personality, there's, we, we sense that we're eternal spirits. Because birthdays come and go and we feel exactly the same mm -hmm. on the inside as we've always felt. Praise the Lord. <laughs> our point number two. So we looked within, now we're going to look at the physical body. And our bodies are fearfully... And wonderfully made. And there's a lot more information in, in, in the book, The Truth Shall Set You Free, as he goes through various parts of the body. But, but really, there is so much to learn about the human body that the doctors have to specialize. <laughs> you know, your eye, nose, and throat. Mm -hmm. You know, you're specialized in the lungs, you specialize in the heart, you know, your bone mm -hmm. doctor, uh, be, because it, there's just so much to learn about the human body, and it's so, so fascinating. J 
just think of our eyesight, for example. The eye is absolutely remarkable. You know, they said there's about a million rods and cones there. You've got a lens in the front, so the light comes in. And when it hits the lens, it, you know, it projects on the back of the eye, the retina, upside down. But somehow, that information gets from that screen on the back of your eye to somewhere in your brain... And, and you see a picture, right side up, with color and detail and movement. How'd that happen? You know, it, it is so complex. It, the way the lens adjusts for light, you know, opens and closes automatically. You don't have to think about it. It just does it. You know, man has developed cameras, you know, based on their research of the eye. And our cameras are pretty remarkable, but not as remarkable as the human eye. How does a picture travel from the screen on the back of your eye to the brain where, where you're conscious of, there it is. Is it by electricity? <clears throat> no, it's the, the optic nerve. It it, it's, it goes through. Uh, you know, it's wonderful. <laughs> and then then think of the eagles. They say an eagle has their eyesight is like fifty times better. You know, more distinct. They can be way up there and see that fish and <laughs> you know and adjust their dive and everything to pluck up that fish, you know, the eyesight, you know, the hearing is absolutely amazing, okay, in the, our head, on both sides of our head, we've got a series of bones, we've got a drum, you know, and the sound waves that my vocal cords are producing, travel through the air, hit the drum in your ear, start some vibrations going. That vibration is carried through a nerve, through a center in your brain. And you hear words. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely amazing. Y you know, that, that we can actually communicate with each other you know, through vibrations sent through the air, you know, and if we didn't have that little drum in our ear, you know, it would, you know, it'd be a little bit harder. You know, we'd have to use our eyes and, and read if we, if we did not have hearing, you know, and our heart is an amazing organ in our body that pumps, you know, just regularly, you know, our entire life but does a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. every day. It's just faithful, pumping, pumping, pumping. We have 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our body. <laughs> 60,000 miles. There's nowhere you can poke yourself uh, that you're not going to get a little drop of blood that comes out. You know, some of those capillaries are so small you know, they just one one at a time are pushed through there. You know, our lungs are amazing. We breathe in oxygen. We exhale carbon dioxide. That gets into our blood stream. Our heart pumps it. Goes it all around and carries food. You know, the digestive system. You know, is, is very remarkable. We eat things. It's breaks it down into its components. Um, it, it's absorbed into the blood and carried around. Some of it's stored as energy for <laughs> the hard days yet ahead of us. Uh, but it's remarkable. And how did this happen? 
you know, when you take biochemistry, you're going to learn the Krebs cycle, what happens when you eat food, um, how it's changed into glucose and, you know, the end products and, and, and just the cycle. Who designed that cycle? <laughs> See, you, you don't go very far before you, you're starting to draw conclusions. Wow. I think of human reproduction. It, it's absolutely amazing. You know, you've got the, the egg of a woman, which you can barely see. It's about the size of a pinhead. Then the male sperm that you cannot see with the human eye. They're so small. You have to magnify it 200 times to even be able to see those little buggers <laughs> wiggling away there. But yet they carry all of the gen genetic information needed. It, it, it's, it's the service manual. <laughs> the, you know, the, the manual on how to put together the human body. The entire human body with all of its complexity um, and it's condensed so small, you can barely see it, you know, with the human eye. They say that the information contained in the DNA, if you put into books, would fill, you know, the libraries of the land. The information. You know, and so the basis of our body the base of our life is information. Is the DNA is a code. You've got four, four letters in that code, code four base elements. Uh, but the combination of them, you know, produce the proteins and enzymes and everything else uh, necessary to life. It's the instruction manual. You have an instruction manual that's totally unique. Mm, yeah. Nobody else has the same instruction manual mm -hmm. as was given to you. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it's in the form of a code, mm -hmm. chemical code. Mm -hmm. So codes imply intelligence, yeah. right? And all, all of life, plant life and animal life, is based on a code. Therefore, <laughs> you know, what, what's the conclusion of that? Codes imply intelligence. All life is based on a code, then life must have an intelligent creator. Mm -hmm. Intelligent creator or source. Because again, the complexity is just so astounding of the human body. How about the lymphatic system? How about your uh, your body defense system? You know how it can defend against viruses that that attack it. You know your immune system. <laughs> it's absolutely astounding, mm -hmm. and how. You can go to the graduate school, how you can become a doctor and end up an atheist just boggles my mind. I cannot, I cannot comprehend that. <laughs> but yet I've had some, my, my bio, biochemistry teacher was an atheist and an evolutionist. But when I got done with class, I'd go out in the prairie and just worship Hallelujah. Almighty God. Because I'd say, nobody, you know, this could not happen by accident. You cannot have an explosion in a junkyard and have it assemble a Boeing 747. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there is absolutely no way. And so we look at our bodies and we say, wow, 
were fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. Then we look at, you know, our surroundings, this world that we live in. And again, we, we were confronted with intelligence and design on every hand. Uh, we see the plant life that, that grows. You know, we put a seed in the ground, you know, and then we have a harvest in the fall. Uh, we have the hydraulic cycles of, you know, the sun hits the earth, water evaporates, it rains, and this goes on and on and on and on. You know, the rain comes, the snow comes, God waters the earth, and it goes back and comes down again. And, and, and it's purified mm -hmm. uh, when it comes mm -hmm. down. And how would that happen? You know, soil. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's billions of living creatures in, in just a handful of soil. Mm -hmm. You know, and they all have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And so we're mm -hmm. surrounded, you know, with astonishment on every hand if we'll just open our eyes and look mm -hmm. around and take in the information. And again, it, it all points to an intelligent creator. Yeah. Uh, because we, we, we understand cause and effect mm -hmm. at a very young age. And we look at the effect, you know, this beautiful world with all of its uh, cycles, mm -hmm. um, and, and there had to be a cause. You know, what caused it? Why is it that the animals must have oxygen to survive, and they give off a waste product, carbon dioxide? Plants, on the other hand, <laughs> must have carbon dioxide to live. That's, their, that's what they breathe in. And their waste product is oxygen. <laughs> yes. And so the animals and the, the plants just absolutely mm -hmm. complement each other. Mm -hmm. One could not survive without the other. Right. You know, you couldn't have the plants uh, w without there being a source of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't have the animals without there being a, a source of oxygen. Mm -hmm. You have to have them both at the same time. You know, one didn't evolve ahead of the other. They were created <laughs> by, by our great God. Yeah, there was a modern uh, atheist scientist whose name was very prominent. I can't recall it. Now. But when the science of DNA came out, he finally had to make some concessions. Mm -hmm. And he stated, okay, there is a universal designer. But I will not go to church. <laughs> <laughs> that's his, you know, that, that's the stubbornness of the human will. Yeah. Professing yeah. to be wise, they become fools yes. because they reject obvious truth yes. and, and uh, want to blame or want to credit an explosion, you know, the Big Bang with, <laughs> with the complexity of life that we see on this earth. And you think of the plants can you explain to me how life can be stored in a seed? They have actually found grains of wheat in the pyramids that have been there two, three thousand years. And they found them, and I would put them in a lab, petri dish or something, and sprouted, grew. <laughs> Can you explain to me how life can exist and lie dormant in the form of a seed for 3,000 years. See, when you can't explain, you worship. That's right. <laughs> yes. You know, you just say, God, you're yes. so wonderful. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and even if you can explain, the more explanation, um, it, it's just such a complex a co co complexity uh, in the, in the answer, uh, you know, and, 
and it's astounding. Mm -hmm. And again, these things are, made, are, I believe, part of God's plan in creating such a diversity of plants and animals and things like that, is just to impress upon our mind his greatness mm -hmm. and how wonderful he is, how astounding our great God is. And so the, the earth, you know, the plant and animal kingdom, it's amazing. The animals, in some regards, have much greater abilities than men, than mankind. Mm -hmm. For example, your dog can smell mm -hmm. about 50 times better than, than we can, mm -hmm. you know. And they have instincts that boggle our minds. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the salmon, you know, from the West Coast of America mm -hmm. and Alaska. And they're just remarkable. They're born up in the little, little creek up here somewhere. And, you know, that joins other other rivers you know finally comes over here to the Pacific Ocean and after they grow up a certain age they find their way down to the ocean mm -hmm. and the scientists have put a little tag on the back of their fin mm -hmm. said if you catch the salmon you know right back and tell us where you got it and so this might be the Columbia River so they come down to the Columbia River they've caught them off the coast of Peru, down in South America, they brought them off, off of the coast of Africa. I'm not Africa, Japan. I'm sorry, yeah. Japan. And they're out there for four years. Then, at the end of four years, they'll travel three, four, five thousand miles mm -hmm. to the Columbia River. Come up the Columbia, you know. They have a lot of options, but they go to the very place that they were spawned, mm -hmm. lay their eggs and die. That's amazing. How, how do they know how to do that? Is there a road map for the bottom of the ocean? Uh, they have internal GPS. Uh, they, they must have. <laughs> that God has imprinted in their little GPS system. You know, we didn't even know about GPS for 20 you know, until the last 20, 30 years. But look what God has created. He, he fixed in their being a location. Okay. And they can go four or 5,000 miles, then come back to the very same place. Without AAA. And, and, and we think we're so great with our GPS. <laughs> See, man has simply, you know, discovered laws of nature uh, to, to come up with this technology. You know, aerodynamics, you know, flight, uh, they looked at the birds. Mm -hmm. yeah. But God designed the birds to, to uh, follow the laws of aerodynamics. You know, man in his learning finally discovered what the laws were. He didn't invent them. He just discovered the laws that God put in the universe to, dis to govern his universe. You know, and that's where technology comes from. Hmm. Hallelujah. So again, the animals are, are just astounding. Uh, have you heard of the incubator bird? It's a bird that lives in Australia, and it's. Yes, it is. It is. Well, that's not the incubator. Well, this is a very unique bird too. <laughs> this, see that nest? Yeah. This is the entrance. Oh, down wow. here. Hmm. Okay, that one's made by a weaver bird from India. I brought that home from India one time. And what they did with this weaver bird, they they took some eggs took them to the laboratory, hatched them, grew a generation in the laboratory where they could lay eggs. Mm -hmm. So five generations in the laboratory. Then they released them. And guess what? 
They went out and built oh. the nest. Mm -hmm. But wow. they didn't learn wow. it from mommy, you know, because they were in the lab for five generations. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they were released, wow. they built the nest that God had programmed into their little bird brain <laughs> yeah, bird. to build. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the incubator bird, Australia, is very unique. The way he courts his beloved female, um, he builds a compost pile of leaves and grass and green, whatever he can do, and apparently the bigger the better to impress his female. <laughs> so when he gets it big and you know beautiful enough to impress the female, you know, they mate in the Mrs. Weaver, uh, Mrs. Uh, incubator. incubator Bird, lays her egg, and then flies away. <laughs> and now it's up to the male. The males take care of the egg. Uh, but this male doesn't sit on the egg. Um, he's got a compost pile, and... The heat of the compost, you know, the green grass and stuff as it decomposes, you know, is a certain temperature. And if it gets too hot in the day, you know, he'll he'll bring the egg a little bit closer to the surface. If it gets cold at night, he'll, mm -hmm. you know, push it a little bit into, you know, where it's warmer. Mm -hmm. And he regulates the temperature of that egg within one degree. Oh, wow. mm. That's amazing. Oh, that is amazing. Without sitting on it. Oh, my. That's amazing. Now, how, how did that behavior evolve? <laughs> yeah. From that big thing. <laughs> I, I would recommend also a movie, March of the Penguins. Yes, yeah. I've seen that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's completely yeah. amazing. Yeah. It is. Amazing. Yeah. What yeah. they do in that yeah. Arctic, you know, and the mom goes. Yeah, and the mama lays the egg and yeah. the daddy and he takes barely care survives. of it. She comes out and with some fish in her belly and barfs that up. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> and I'm they all survive. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful story. Yeah. It is. Okay, I will do one more. The honeybees. Okay. Uh, honeybees are fascinating because God has given them a way to communicate. And it's very essential that they communicate accurately. Because what happens, um, you have a hive of bees, and they send out a scout bee. And the scout bee, you know, flies around, and you find a source of nectar. Um, so he'll take a sample, go back to the hive, pass around the sample, and then he tells the other, play, other bees where he found that. And they use the sun in, in reference, you know, kind of triangulate, you know, to tell them exactly where they need to go. And, of course, bees don't speak English. <laughs> they don't speak Spanish <laughs> or any other human language, but they have to communicate accurately. And part of the communication is they have to know the distance and be able to communicate that because the bee, when he, the other bees that, you know, have to pay attention to the information, they have to take on enough fuel, enough nectar, so that they can make it to the destination. And when they arrive, they want to arrive pretty close on empty so that you can bring back a full load to the hive. So if you arrive with three quarters of a tank, you know, it's, it's uh, not the most efficient use of your labor to just take on a quarter of a tank. You know, so, that, so they're, they have to arrive pretty close to empty. But if they don't have enough, they don't take on enough fuel, they'll crash and burn <laughs> before they get there and die. Oh. And, and so therefore, you know, this communication has to be really, really accurate. And they do it by means of what's called the waggle tail dance. <laughs> they, they, they're on the comb. It's like and, and they'll, go, they'll, they'll go like in a figure eight, 
they'll orient themselves, you know, in relation to the to the sun, the vigor with which they they shake their tail, you know, is, is it all communicates and they're passing on samples and doing their dance. But they communicate by this dance. And so you know, you come up with what's called irreducible complexity. Mm-hmm. See, if, if the bees didn't have that in the very first hive, you know, they could not survive without having this ability to communicate accurately. So where did that come from? Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. And, and it just puts a big hole into the idea of evolution. Mm-hmm. Okay, they let's go on. Information <laughs> <at once. laughs> so, again, we go back to, to uh, David. He said, Lord, when I consider the heavens, or no, Psalm 19, 1 through 4, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yes. The firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day to day brings forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no place uh, where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out into all the world. So the heavens declare the glory of God. So as we look at the heavens, you know, we're really overwhelmed, you know, especially with these new telescopes that they have. But when we look in the heavens, we, we see order. You know, we have we have our sun, we're part of a solar system. <clears throat> That's the sun, the earth is here. You know, and we have a little moon that goes goes around the Earth. You know, and some other other planets going around our sun. Um, we're relatively close to our sun. It takes uh, nine and a half minutes for the sun that's for the light that's produced on the sun to hit the Earth. You know, and we hear them talk about millions and millions of light years mm-hmm. away in terms of distance. But it only takes nine and a half minutes for the light to get to, to the earth. But our sun is radiating energy. And because of the distance that we are from the earth, we, we just get a small percentage of the total amount of energy land at lands on the earth. The rest is, you know, just out into space. And the amount of energy that actually hits the earth is this percentage. How many zeros is that? It's one three millionth of the total output of the power of the sun hits the earth. Yet we're worried about global warming. And and, and it's just such a tiny amount that actually hits the sun because we're we're so small, even though we're relatively close, we're so small compared to the, you know, the, the area around us that that's all the percentage of the power that hits the earth, but the sun is powerful. You know, if we are any closer Mm -hmm. to the earth, or to the sun, you know, we we couldn't survive. If we are any further away from the sun, we'd freeze Freeze to death. death. And so it's just perfect. (laughs) How'd that happen? Big Bang did that? To make the perfect conditions uh, for life? That's right. Yeah. And we understand that our, our star here, our sun, is one star in the Milky Way galaxy, of which there are a hundred, hundred billion. And counting. hundred billion stars. 
in our galaxy. How much, how much power is that? You know, if we could calculate the energy that the sun puts out every second, I, I, I did hear, hear a statistic. They said the sun produces the equivalent of 10,000 of the atomic bombs that was dropped at Hiroshima per second. <laughs> 10,000 atomic bombs per second. And we just get a little... But how much power is that? How many megatons? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, then <clears throat> think of, okay, if, if one star has that much power, now let's multiply it by 100 billion. But how many galaxies have there? this one galaxy? Mm -hmm. How many galaxies? The figures I have are really old now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 years ago they said there were about 200 mil billion galaxies. Mm -hmm. But I think with these new telescopes, yes. yeah. probably yeah. double that. So let's let's say 500 billion galaxies. You know, multiply those together <laughs> times the power in one. You see, and you you become you, you you're confronted with power that's imaginable. <clears throat> Where did it come from? It must come from an all-powerful God. See, so now we're ready to draw some conclusions. Our first conclusion is that okay. Our first conclusion: that there has to be a God. Mm -hmm. There is no way that we can explain the intricacy, the design, the power, the majesty, the beauty, the harmony, the order. Without, the, without there being a God. You know, just the, the rotation of the, the planets in our solar system. I mean, it, it is so precise that that's how we account for our time. You know, if we say, okay, the Earth rotates on its axis in 24 hours. And so we count time by the faithfulness of God. The fact that the universe is designed in such a way that there's precision mm -hmm. in, in absolute order. Mm -hmm. And so, again, our first conclusion is there has to be a God. You can't tell me an explosion produced all of the order and harmony and beauty uh, that we see in this entire universe. Mm -hmm. We see that God is all-powerful. Because we, we're surrounded by his power. Even on earth, we can feel his power. You know, in the windstorm. We feel it in the earthquake. We feel it in the tsunami. You know, we feel it standing on the ocean and the big waves come crashing on shore. Uh, we feel it when the huge tree comes crashing down in the woods. You know, our conclusion is that God's all powerful. Uh, he must have all knowledge based on what we see around us. The communication of a honeybee, you know, the information that is contained in the human body, the, the instruction manual, the construction manual to put a body together the knowledge that takes and each one is unique each snowflake is unique and there are trillions of them in a single blizzard trillions each one is unique 
So they must be all knowing. We we come to understand that that he must not be a physical being, that he must be a spirit. Even as we look within ourselves and, and discover that the real me is a spirit. So we see that God is a spirit. And because he is a spirit, he's not confined to a physical body. And so he must have the ability to be everywhere present in this vast universe. If he created it, uh, then he has an obligation to superintend over it. And, and so he must be there. He has to be a God who is there, he is here, he is everywhere present. He must be wise. How do you feel wise? W-I-S-E. Yeah, okay. Uh, he, he must be good. He must be faithful. In the, in the discharge of his responsibilities, because we see his faithfulness, you know, in the heavens. We see his faithfulness in the provision that he's made for us. We have a need for food. He's provided food. We have a need, you know, he, he's faithful to provide everything that we need. And so this, this is just a small list. Uh, the one I missed here is eternal. <clears throat> that he is not limited by time as we sense that we are. That this great God must be an eternal God. So the result of these obligations, I'm going to come back to Romans again. Romans 1. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that's what we have here, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. So once the mind of man comes to this conclusion, you know, which a thinking person with his eyes wide open in this world ought to come to this conclusion when he looks at himself and he looks around him, you know, and applies his mind to, to just observe this world. He comes to a conclusion that God is and that he is these things, that, that this is God. So a, a concept is then developed in the, uh, the mind of man, that this is God. And in the light of that, we see that this is me, that that represents me, mm -hmm. in comparison to God. And as soon as that conception comes to the mind, mm -hmm. that God is big and I am very small mm -hmm. in this universe, as soon as that conception comes to the mind, there comes an obligation. An obligation comes to the heart of man to honor and worship. The, the 
this great God. Have you ever noticed in you know in your, your life experience that when you come into the presence of somebody, your fellow man, that has greater abilities than you do in certain areas, something within you just respects and mm -hmm. honors that individual. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Yes. yes. When I see a mechanic, like my son, you know, work on the helicopter, mm -hmm. you know, and, and seeing him be being so absolutely precise, you know, the way he puts on the seal or... Mm -hmm. I really honor that, you know, because I don't have those abilities, you know, but he does. You know, my son, Quentin, he can sit down the keyboard. He, he could, as a 12-year-old boy, type 100 words a minute. Just, you know, he's fast on the keyboard, you know, and I can't type quite that fast, you know, but I honor that, you see. Mm -hmm. I honor my son because I see in him a superior ability. Mm -hmm. and, and so it is with all of us, I believe, that when we, when we see superior abilities in what we have, mm -hmm. there's something that rises up within us to render that person honor. We respect mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to our text. Verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God to give thanks. Can, can you see how ridiculous that is? Can you see how, how terrible it is when, it's, when by nature we're created in such a way as we render honor with those that have superior abilities? And here we are a speck of dust in the vast universe, God is so great. It says, even though they knew God, they knew he was that great, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They became foolish in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Why was it darkened? They're rejecting obvious truth. They're rejecting the light that any thinking individual in the right use of their mind would come to the conclusion that God is, and he's all-powerful, and he's faithful, and has all these characteristics. Even though they knew God, they refused to honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Because they're rejecting truth. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They weren't born fools. They became fools by rejecting their natural observations. Say, so, oh, Big Bang did it. Professing mm -hmm. to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged. Verse 23, they exchanged the glory of God. They had the glory, you know, they knew what it was, but they exchanged it. The glory of the incorruptible man for an image in the form of corruptible man. You know, he, he elevated himself. He said, no, I'm the most important thing. See, right. it, we have to get a handle on the nature of sin. And this is explaining it to us. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, elevated themselves. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. See, they had it. Even though they didn't have the Bible, they had the truth of God. They knew that God was, and that's mm -hmm. how he was. And they knew that they were just a speck of dust. But yet they puffed themselves up. 
and, mm -hmm. and denied God. They exchanged the glory. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their heart, to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. <clears throat> for they exchanged the truth of God for, for a lie. That means they had to have it. You can't exchange something you don't have. Right. So they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And the creature wasn't the crocodile. The creature was almighty man. That's who they worshipped. Thus it is a man is utterly without excuse in his choice and persistence in selfishness or supreme self-interest. Having exchanged the truth of God for a lie, Worship the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The Apostle Paul expressed man's obligation in his great benediction. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So as we continue to use our natural observations, we find things in the creation that disturb us, that bother us, you know, that raise questions in our minds. Uh, we see death. We see violence in nature, you know, where these lions are, you know, taking down the smaller prey, and these crocodiles are grabbing whatever they can. These pythons are, you know, after these little antelope and these vipers. And, and we, see, we see that. And we see a trail of death. We see a trail of sorrow. We see pestilence. We see the birds that come in after we've labored so hard to have a crop and hear these birds come and just help themselves. Or we do get a crop. You know, then the rats come in and devour it and waste it. Uh, we see starvation. We see injustice on every hand. Um, you, you know, we, we experience pain. We experience death. And we wonder what I thought this was a beautiful world. You know, we see so much good. Why is there so much sorrow? Why is there so much heartache? Why is there this violence in nature? Uh, why do the germs attack our bodies? You know, why, why is our lifespan so short? When, when just we're starting to learn things and become wise, then death comes. And, and, and snuffs out life. And so these questions come into the mind of people. And point B, he says, something dreadful has obviously gone wrong in moral relations. There must be a serious reason for this admi mixture of tragedy in the presence of overwhelming good. Someone must be responsible if there has been a destructive rebellion by moral beings and the great moral governor has reacted in righteous moral responsibility, then we can look through the clouds of tragedy and find an intelligent basis of intelligent worship in full knowledge that God's loving purpose has been hindered by man. See, and that's the conclusion we come to. Wow. You know, this, this, we're in a fallen world. And it must be that this great God is, is bringing forth a consequence, a punishment uh, to, to uh, rebellious mankind. And point C, our conscience affirms that we have been guilty of rebelling and continuing a moral rebel revolution against our intelligence of refusing to live our lives in absolute recognition of the divine being 
and the obvious rights of our fellow man. And to me, it is obvious when you, you consider that God is this, and we are this. You know, and other, other people are like us. We're, we're just dust. But we have an obligation to honor him and, and respect our fellow man. See, and when we choose not to live that way, you know, we're, we're violating the, the intelligence that God has given us. Because in our right minds, knowing that God is that way, it invests upon us an obligation to honor and worship and respect him. And when we see our fellow man having the same feelings, the same aspirations as we have, then we have an obligation to respect and honor our fellow man. And our conscience affirms that, that we have violated, violated that. We have not done what our enlightened mind has told us we ought to do. We have refused to live like he wants us to live. So on our page four, he says, Conscience is the function of the intellect. It compares what we, it compares what we are to what we know. And the whole mass of humanity appears to have joined in and continues in this rebellion. Thus, we might expect that there would be extreme divine reactions to man's refusal to conform to God's loving and wise moral government, and that just consequences were being meted out by a dutiful moral governor, that God must restrain sinful development and reward its due. See, a, a loving, faithful God would do that. He would do what he can to restrain it. And even when he gave the curse to Adam and Eve in the garden, part of that curse was like a restraint. He said, uh, thorns and thistles, by the sweat of your brow, uh, you're going to eat your bread. Thorns and thistles he has given unto you. So it introduced a, a lifelong struggle with nature. Uh, where man is going to now have to work diligently just to survive. But in a way, it's, it's God's way of restraining him. Because if you have to struggle just to survive, it gives you less opportunity to get into trouble. Yeah, and so God has done what he could to restrain uh, sinful development. Uh, thus, we might expect that there would be extreme divine reactions to man's refusal to conform to God's loving and wise moral government, and that consequences were being meted out by a dutiful moral governor, that God would restrain sinful development and also reward its due. Uh, this would involve the whole creation of which man is the center. And so the creation itself suffers because of man's rebellion against God. To point D, our observations indicate the goodness, the intelligence, the wisdom, the greatness, and the energy or power of such a God uh, would bring to man's understanding the reasons for the, admix for the mixture of tragedy among unending goodness. We would therefore expect that there would be a Bible in which, which would reveal the inner secrets of the divine being and lead into truth and measures of mercy. So again, the expectation is in the heart of man that we want to know answers. You know, we know that there's a God through our natural observations. We see that we're speck of dust, we're, we're conscious of our rebellion, we're conscious of the violence in nature and things are not right, we sense it deep in our heart, there's an uneasiness, there's a sense that there's more to life that I'm now experiencing, 
And so there's there's the expectation that God, if he's all-knowing, would be able to give us answers. And, if, and so the expectation is there for the Bible. And the missionaries have discovered that when they've gone to far-off lands, how the people had an expectation. We, we knew there was a God, uh, and we knew that he had a book. You know, and you're here to bring us the book? Yeah. Uh, that that story has been told over and over again. You know, because we're all the same, whether in the jungle or, you know, no matter so where true. we are. With the Muslims who have had so many dreams of the man in white, yes. in the crown, with a book, yes. with keys, Bringing the book. calling them to follow him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, our final point. Six, all men affirm an obligation to God and man. And that's what we have here in this. Uh, we're down here, we affirm, we, we see it, you know, that we have an obligation to honor God. We see that we have an ob obligation to respect our fellow man. Uh, the universal practice of religious ceremonies among people who have never heard of biblical revelation establishes the fact, therefore, that all men affirm their obligation to God and man. You know, how else can you explain religion where man goes through all kinds of ceremonies and cuts themselves and, you know, they have a sense that, that they've done wrong, you know, and they're trying to appease, you know, a, a creator that they know to exist. Or else how would you explain religion? all over the world in every tribe. You know, it springs from their natural observations. <clears throat> so all men affirm their obligation to God and man and have a sense of personal guilt. This guilt can only arise from their natural observations along with the testimony of conscience and the direct revelation of the Holy Spirit as to their relations and their obligations to a great first cause that must exist and to their fellow man. So I'll re read the remarks that he has here. I, th I think they're very insightful. He says, The impressions that we allow our natural observations to have upon our minds are in accordance with the response we are willing to make in adjusting our way of living. So if we don't want to change, we won't pay any attention to it. But when we really observe and look and want to discover uh, what God is like, you know, if we yield to that, if we, if we give him the honor, and the worship that he deserves, you know, then, then he imparts more. He says, first, we do not allow ourselves to have a greater concept of God than we're willing to conform to, mm -hmm. to dwell upon or think about the greatness and character of God is to increase our sense of duty and the value of any experimental relationship that is offered through the great measures of restoring our broken fellowship. What he's saying is the, the more you learn, you know, the more you observe God's creation, you know, the, the, the greater you understand God really is. And when you understand his greatness and see his smallness, your smallness, then mm -hmm. you have that obligation. But when you submit to that and worship him and because he's designed you for that. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, he will, he will unveil himself mm -hmm. even more. And so I, I firmly believe what he said there. We don't allow ourselves to have a greater concept of God than we're willing to conform to. Is that why all the noise? I mean, Satan has us so, you know, we've got the internet, we've got the television, we've got all this going on so we don't have to look at this. You know, we can be busy ourselves, yeah. right? Exactly. Wow, all the diversion. Yeah. 
Then second, he says, we do not allow ourselves to have a greater concept of ourselves than we're willing to conform to. To consider ourselves as a product of the love and wisdom of God in the image and likeness of God is to establish the God image of personality which impels us toward a life of true intelligence and honor. But if we believe the opposite, that we're just the product of time and chance, then it's the law of the jungle. It's me first. I'm going to trample on over you to get what I want. And that, that's the way of the world. And, and so as we realize the greatness of God and conform ourselves to that, it impels man. It makes man great. Hallelujah. And there's no limits. There are no limits. And that's what set, sets the African brother free. When they realize that the, the limits are self-imposed. That through Christ, doesn't matter how much poverty they're in right now, through Christ, he can absolutely transform their life. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So, Father, I thank you for this lesson, Lord. I thank you Father, for this world that you've created. And, Father, I pray that each one of us in the days to come would, would use more fully our powers of observation to, to just examine what you have made, Lord, even the little things. Lord, from looking through the microscope to looking through a telescope into the vast universe, Father, we see you. We see your handiwork everywhere we look. And Father, we do see your greatness. We do see your faithfulness. We see your loving kindness. We see your goodness. We see your love for beauty. We see your love and what you have provided. And Father, I, I just pray, Lord, that you will help us in this area, Lord, to really, to really have a greater understanding of who you are, Lord, that we might love you more, more fully, Lord, because truly you are worthy of the deepest devotion and love of our hearts for all that you've done to us, for us. Lord, we just appreciate you so much. And Father, when we know you, it makes selfishness and sin look so ridiculous and so, so, so evil. And Father, I just, I just pray, Lord, that you'd give us this heavenly perspective that we might live lives worthy and pleasing unto you, O Lord, and that we might be a help and benefit to those of our fellow man who are, who are struggling, who are weary and heavy laden and carrying burdens and, Lord, living lives of quiet desperation, not knowing where to turn. Father, I, I just pray that you would give us the ability to communicate uh, in, in a way that, that would, would touch the hearts of, of men and women. And Father, we just thank you for this lesson tonight. Bless it to our understanding, Lord, and as we go through it, uh, even again, perhaps tomorrow, reading through these things, Father, just just develop these concepts of truth in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.